okay, well, that's, that's, uh, that's quite a moon. So let's move out one, one step. So as we move out through the solar system, we start getting to more normal, but still not completely normal looking moons of Jupiter. The next one out is going to be Europa, which is the place that we most often think of as here's where life might be in the solar system. It's a perfect sphere, at least as far as any object in the solar system can be a perfect sphere and still be solid. It's, it has the least amount of features in terms of up and down features. It doesn't really have mountains. It doesn't really have valleys. It has almost no craters. And this is because it's top crust is basically a five kilometer deep ice. It's an ice mantle. And we think, think that beneath that is another 50 kilometers of liquid ocean. And so this is one of those situations where, like on Mars, geologists can look at the various craters and say, okay, this place is old while that place is young because that place has tons of really large craters while this place has very few craters. And so if, it, if there aren't a lot of craters, then geologists know that it's being resurfaced by lava or I guess in this case, the ice. But we're, but we're saying there's nothing. There's no craters. There's no mountains. There's no valleys. There's just smooth. Cracks. There's cracks. There's swirls. It looks like what happens when you have a lake freeze and expand and it gets cracks as it expands. And when you get uh, glacial flow, you can get compression lines in the ice. And scientists are trying to figure out what all the different swirling patterns, what the freckles, what all the different strange features that are mostly features because they're a different color. Uh, in the ice just might be. And so if you've got a shell of, say, five kilometers, there must be spots where, as it's just cracking open, where there's it's almost straight to the water, maybe just a couple of hundred meters. And there are these features called freckles that we think might actually be where you had a warm cell of water underneath that was heated up by interactions with Jupiter and its magnetic fields and its gravitation. And these cells of warm water rose to the surface and were basically hot water volcanoes that came up through the surface and made a small mound on the ice. So yeah, we, we see hints of the warmer water from below coming up and refreezing on the surface of Europa. And so on Io, we've got volcanoes with molten rock pouring out. Europa's further away from Jupiter, so we don't have the, the molten rock at this, you know, the same kind of volcanoes, but instead the interior of the planet is kept warm enough to heat the water underneath, but it's also exposed to space. And so you're getting this icy shell on top. Exactly. And it's, it's just fantastic to look at it. And there are different places where we think that spirals on the surface in the ice might've been generated by slight changes in what part of the ice was pointed toward Jupiter. And there's actually thinking that while the surface of the ice is generally tidally locked to Jupiter, just like our moon is tidally locked to the Earth, such that if you were standing on Jupiter, you'd only see the same face of Europa at any point in time. Uh, for every one time Europa goes around Jupiter, the, the moon uh, rotates once on its axis. We think this is true of the crust on top, but there are people who've put forward theories that maybe the core of the moon is rotating a little bit faster. So we have differential rotation between the core and the surface, and this could be perhaps even generating magnetic fields. It could be helping to heat up everything and keep this ocean vibrant and in interesting underneath the surface ice. And it's time for the old cliche. If we find uh, water here on Earth, if we find water, we find life. Exactly. So the thinking is that there could be life on Europa. And one of the great questions is how do we go and explore for that life and not accidentally take life with the space probe? How do we go and search Ganymede and make sure that we don't accidentally carry Earth-born critters off to the outer part of the solar system? All right. Let's move one more out. <laughs> now we're getting out to Ganymede. This is a moon that is bigger than the planet Mercury. 
This is an object that were it allowed to happily orbit uh, all by its lonesome instead of orbiting around Jupiter, it would be a full-fledged planet. No questions asked. We have a planet. And it's bigger. It's the biggest moon in the solar system, right? It's the biggest moon in the solar system. Its diameter is 5,260 kilometers. It's planet-sized. I actually remember that people used to think that Titan was the largest moon in the solar system. But after the Voyagers went past, they realized that what they're seeing with Titan was actually it has this big, thick, hazy atmosphere. Yeah. And once you took the atmosphere away, Ganymede wins out. And so. Ganymede doesn't really have an atmosphere. It's this mostly rocky, it has some water, it has some ice moon that it's just really neat to look at because it has this variation of light and dark. It's highly cratered. It, it's just a really neat place. And it has a very complex geology. It has mountains. It has valleys. It's had some sort of volcanism in the past. There's signs of lava flow. But not so much lava flow that it's erased the craters. So when you look at it, it really looks like some sort of piece of sporting equipment that just had a really hard, hard life. It's also a, an object that generates its own magnetic field. It has a liquid iron core, we think. And that liquid iron core is enough to give it its own magnetic field, making it just as interesting as Mercury in a lot of different ways. So it's got going for it that it's big. But we don't think that it has like ice, an icy crust or a uh, shell. We don't see a lot of lava. And we still see the, the record of the asteroid bombardment. So we can get a pretty good sense that it's not being resurfaced as, as quickly as the, other, as the other moons. Mostly true. But we actually don't know for certain that it doesn't have a subsurface layer of liquid water. One of the weird things about it is it, it does have some ice on it. And there's thinking that maybe there is an underground sea there, that perhaps this is what is helping to drive the magnetic field is if there's salt water, salt water conducts electricity. What if there's a conductive layer of salt water that's sandwiched between other layers of material in this planet moon, and that's part of what's behind the magnetic field? It could be that this object is another place we could go looking for life, although it's nowhere near as probable as looking for life on Europa. All right, well, let's move out one more. Okay, so now we're out to Callista. Callista is another one of these rocky giant moon objects. It's almost the size of Mercury, but not quite. It's totally covered in pox marks. It's covered in these light colored chips from where it's gotten hit with different uh, meteors, hit with different debris. And it started with a darkish surface and each one of these nicks exposes the ice beneath and just makes it a really neat looking moon. And in some places where it's been hit, there's these ring patterns traveling out from it. So if you hit it hard enough at the right period of time, and we're still working to understand exactly how these ring-like patterns emerged, not only do you get the crater, but around the crater you get a series of concentric rings, like waves traveling away from a rock that splashed into the ocean. Once again, that's one of the things you've got to see the pictures to, to really appreciate that, because it's quite an amazing uh, spectacle. What, one of the most famous ones is called Valhalla. The The cratering on this this moon is just truly spectacular. There's also a bunch of different features where we can tell that something that was disrupted, a comet or an asteroid that was broken into multiple different pieces, just nailed itself into Callista and left a train of little circular craters behind as it hit in successive order. Now, just to talk about all the moons in general, it, it's funny. I mean, with the spacecraft that have already been there, They've turned up so much interesting information, and yet we still have so many questions about, about what's going on with these moons, including, I guess, the most important question, is there life on, on Europa? So what plans are there to go back and re-examine them? Well, there was what was called the Juno Project, but last I checked, NASA had canceled it. And you never know when NASA is going to resurrect a program. That was 
That was the Jupiter Icy Moons Orbiter? And it was one that they'd done amazing work designing a nuclear power generator for it so they could carry a little bit heavier sensors. It was just a really nice mission. It was going to drop a probe onto Europa and just explore the system in detail. Yeah, that's right. With GEMO, I know that it was going to be an ion engine like Dawn and um, Deep Space One, and but it would be a nuclear-powered ion engine. Most most are solar-powered. This would actually use a, a nuclear reactor. And it would have the a thrust and fuel to drop into orbit around each one of Jupiter's icy moons. So it could go into orbit around one, make a whole bunch of analysis and discoveries, and then come out of orbit and go into the next one. And yeah, they canceled it. Yeah, it was an expensive project. We were redesigning the way space probes get from point A to point B. And it's a design that could be reused for other projects, which makes it frustrating to see it canceled. Is Here's this great technology we were completely designing that could be reused in so many different ways and it got canceled but hopefully someday something similar will get resurrected and we will be able to go out and re-explore jupiter look at each of these amazing geological active worlds in detail and look for life and i've also heard ideas about various things that could land on europa and as you say have like some kind of nuclear powered or heat reactor that would warm up the probe and it would just melt down through Europa's shell until it reached the ocean underneath and then deploy a submarine and the submarine would look around and look for life and that's very complicated but, <laughs> but it, once again it would be great it could answer the most important question but I but I've also heard that that with some of those upwellings that you might actually get life just sitting or the water from down below just ending up right on the surface of, of the moon and maybe you could just sample it right there. And we're doing as much practice as we can here on the planet Earth, sending in uh, robotic missions to explore the underwater lakes and watery cave systems down in South America, going and exploring underneath the Antarctic ice. Uh, wherever we can practice, we're trying to practice so that when the time comes and NASA says, yes, we're ready to send this mission, all we have to do is hand over the technology. Well, I can't wait. It's, it's going to be a great new yeah, day. Yeah, these this is one of the places that uh, spacecraft have to go back to as soon as possible because there's still so many mysteries uh, outstanding. And volcanoes are just cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, well, that was great, Pamela. So we've covered Jupiter. And so next we're going to head out to Saturn. And I think we'll probably do the same thing because Saturn's moons are even weirder. And uh, and it has more interesting moons. Like Jupiter just has the four main ones, but Saturn has a dozen <laughs> that, are, that are bizarre. So it's going to take some time. So we'll split that up into two shows as well. But we're actually going to take a quick break from our tour of the solar system, I think, next week to cover a topic that's just been – we just get so many emails about it. We just got to get deal with it, which is the concept of inflation, which is sort of a modification of the Big Bang. So we'll talk about that next week and then go back to our solar system tour. And I got one other thing, which is uh, from time to time, I sort of want to remind people to go on to iTunes and post a review of Astronomy Cast. If you enjoy the show, uh, put up a review, and that really helps us out, helps other people find out about the show, and also helps us rank well in the listings of the, of the podcast. So if you have a second, we would really appreciate it. We actually have some instructions on our website. If you click on uh, support the show, I think one of the first suggestions is uh, write a review. We've actually got a link straight from there to where you do your review on iTunes. So you can just click that and go straight there and write your review, and that will really help us out. And if you've never been to our website, just take a moment to take a look. It's astronomycast.com. We have transcripts. We have images. We have show notes. We have all sorts of different ways that you can help us do this show a little bit better. And uh, we'd just love to hear your feedback on what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. All right, Pamela. We'll talk to you next week. Sounds great. Talk to you later, Fraser. This has been Astronomy Cast, a weekly fact-based journey through the cosmos. 